we appointed a new manager in uh, Russia, manages the country of Russia for Motorola. Newly appointed. I'm the first senior person to visit her. She's confused because she's not quite sure what her job is. You know what I told her? I said, let me think about this. You're the country manager for Motorola in Russia. Which of your customers, which government official, officials think that you control the whole country? Pretty much everybody, right? Right. So your job, as far as I'm concerned, is to assume that responsibility. And until somebody smacks you in the face and says you went too far, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Um, later, you're going to see one of my admonitions. Don't wait to be invited. Show up. <laughs> Show up. <clears throat> okay, so I gave myself credit for this quote. Somebody else may have said it. I don't know. <laughs> Trans matter, mega trans matter even more. China. Let's take China. Actually, no, let's take the United States. I'll start with the United States. How many of you truly, seriously, in your heart of hearts, believe the United States is going to be the only superpower five years from now? Anybody? Not a single hand. Now, you guys are actually smarter than the average bear. You read more, you travel more, and you get it. If you were to ask our countrymen who are voting today if we're going to be the only superpower, I am willing to bet you'd get a majority of people in the room saying yes. They are absolutely, unequivocally naive. All you have to do is leave the country. There are more Porsches being sold in the city of Moscow than the entire state of California last year. There's more wealth being created. Let's just take Russia and the former Soviet Union, which would be the CIS countries, all six of them, and just add for fun the Middle East. And what you get is a population of about 600 million people, 600 million, that'd be twice the size of the United States. Their GDP is growing at 8 to 9%. Oh, by the way, their wealth creation is huge. And if you travel to Kiev or some of the other undeveloped cities, you'll find they're as, oh, interesting and as modern as Dallas. Interesting. We better wake up. We better understand the trends. So let's talk about China. This is one of the real mega trends I think very important. There are 800 women children being born for every thousand males. India, roughly the same stat. That's interesting. Now the Chinese have finally figured out this is not a long-term viable, sustainable answer. So you can now buy the right to have a second child. If nothing else, you got to admit, they're capitalists. <laughs> <clears throat> you better understand what's happening in our world. Don't hunker in as isolationists. And you better evangelize what it is is driving your star, whatever it may be. But it better be global in nature, because the globe has flattened just as we've heard. How many of you have friends in other countries? Pretty much everybody in the room. How many has contacts with other countries? Pretty much daily. Lots of people in the room. It's pretty interesting what's happening. <coughs> Servant leadership. So Stephen Covey, actually a pretty smart guy, written quite a lot, lectures a lot. If you go onto his website, he's, he's actually a pretty profound guy. He believes one of the most important things to understand is, okay, there's two things that drives learning. Desperation and aspiration. Um, when I found this quote, I was at, or when I found this writing, I was actually taken aback by it thinking, well, you know, I haven't thought about that. I was thinking about fear, shame, guilt. I'm Catholic, so a lot of guilt. <clears throat> so I was thinking, well, let me actually think about that in the context of business. And I can't, then I read the following, which is, um, oh, the world is flat, and he sees this servant leadership concept as really profound. This is a guy I have great respect for. I've read this book. I actually started thinking a lot about it. So next quote. The servant leader is servant first. Servant first. So how many of you great at the fact that one of your bosses introduces you to somebody else and says, she works for me? Raise your hand, just for fun. 
I just don't like that. It's very debilitating. I don't like when somebody says, you work, I'm your guy. No, last I checked, there's a team here. Everybody's part of the same tapestry or the mosaic. And frankly, if there's one single piece missing, it's an important piece. So I'll give you a story that actually, if you read The Servant Leader, you'll see the story. There's a professor, uh, actually, who was giving a test to a nursing class. And one of the women in the room is taking the test. She's finished the test, but the last question of the test was, what is the name of the gal that cleans the school or classroom? She, of course, thinks it's a joke. She turns her paper in, and as she's leaving, somebody else in the class must have gotten to the same question and said, hey, does this question really count? And he said, absolutely. She's part of the school. One of the most fun things I ever did in my life as a manager, when I first assumed responsibility for real estate in Dell Computer, was to meet with the real estate group. Said, look, I want one of those shirts. Striped shirt, very different than anybody else's, because they had a uniform. So I'd walk around with my facility shirt on. You would have thought I was a god, just because all I did was acknowledge I was part of their team. How can you acknowledge that you're part of a team as opposed to you're somebody's or somebody's your guy or gal? Guy for me, by the way, is generic. Um, how many of you read Jim Collins? Good to Great or Built to Last? If you haven't, I would invite you to, and in fact, you don't even have to. Just go online, look at this website, and take some of the exercises seriously. Do them. Um, I think it's important. And he highlights servant leadership without talking about servant leadership. And he talks about it in the context of level five leaders have no ego or self-interest. Of course he's overstating it when he says they have no. Of course they have some. But what they are really is they make those subservient to the higher order goal. So what's the higher order goal? For, hi for him, it's all about how companies become great. And by the way, very few companies have enduring sustainable greatness. They all seem to essentially fall prey to, frankly, ego, people, failed leadership. Um, I, I would say this comes from his discussion document. I just pulled it out because I thought you might be intrigued by it. And at some point, I'm assuming that you guys will get copies of this presentation. This also is from Good to Great. And, and it's three pretty profound questions, and I'm using it as a tip. Again, these are the questions you need to ask if you're in a company that's trying to figure out how to be, one, good, but more importantly, eventually great. And his comment is as follows. Ask yourself, what are you, as a company, deeply passionate about? What can you be the best in the world at? And that, by the way, does not mean what you're currently doing. And what drives the economic engine of your company? And are those three things essentially aligned? Do they intersect? If they don't, rethink what you're doing. A friend of mine wrote a trilogy of books called um, Profit from the Core, Beyond the Core, and Unstoppable, a guy named Chris Zook. Great trilogy to read. It's all about the data that supports much of what these three questions try to get at. 